John chapter 12. Let me ask you a question before we start, and uh, we'll read uh, what I have up on the screen, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Um, is there anybody here? Be honest. Be honest when you answer this question, okay? Would you be afraid, let, let's say that, um, let's say that somebody did manage to come into our building tonight and bring a weapon inside this building and just start firing upon people. How many of you, that would scare you? Okay. Um, that is a scary thing. To face someone who you know at that moment has the ability in their hand to take your life away from you or to do you great bodily harm. Sometimes I say it like this. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid it'll hurt for a while. A while. Uh, what were the... Um, Oh, what were the, um, oh, I had it on the tip of my tongue. The Valkyries, what were they? Not the ones in the movies and the comic books. What were the Valkyries? Does anybody know? Okay, in, in uh, Germanic, Scandinavian, uh, Nordic, in those religions, we're talking about Germany, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, all of those northern European nations, they had uh, a similar religious system. Um, whereas, let's say the, uh, the Norwegians had the god Odin, the Germans had the god Wotan. Well, you can, he you can hear the name, you can tell that it's very, very similar. And in all of those religions, they had what was called the Valkyries. And um, a composer by the name of uh, Rich Richard Wagner wrote a piece. Hitler loved it. And it was called The Ride of the Valkyries. And you've probably heard it. It goes... Well, the Valkyries were, according to their religion were the, the goddesses who worked for Odin or Wotan or Thor or whatever god was in charge. And in any battle, the Valkyries would ensure that if you were heroic and brave and ready to charge the enemy in any battle whatsoever, and if it was your time to die in that battle, the Valkyries were in charge and they would give you a very quick, painless death in battle. In other words, if it was your time to die in battle and you proved yourself heroic, then a quick strike to the heart or maybe a quick blade to cut your head off and in a millisecond, you're dead. Now, if you were a coward in death and didn't prove yourself brave in battle, then the Valkyries, they were still going to let you be killed, but they would let you be stabbed and stabbed multiple times in such a way as that it took hours for you to bleed out and you had to agonize until you died. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Amen? Amen. I believe God is the one who chooses. Yes, Sister Betty. I'd just like to say something. Yes, ma'am. If she's not sure that he's saved and he refuses to let somebody come in and pray for him, chances are he's not. I, I would say he's not. 
Yeah. And I don't understand that. I, I mean, I just don't comprehend that. You're about to go into eternity. And yet you are willing, because of your own pride, to let yourself slip into eternity with absolutely no knowledge of where you're going to spend that eternity? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that's what that is. Let's read uh, John chapter 12. And, and the reason why I'm bringing up death is that that's what this is about. And, and the, the question that I really want to ask you is, uh, if you were to be honest, are you afraid to die? I'm not asking you, are you afraid that you're going to heaven? Because every, everybody here wants to go to heaven. But are you afraid of the process of death itself? John 12, verse 17. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave, out of his grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. In other words, this whole thing backfired. Everybody's following Jesus now because of Lazarus. In verse 20, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, um, we would see Jesus. So that's somebody, when they come asking you, will you show me Jesus? Listen, that's the easiest person in the world to witness to. I'm telling you. Listen, I've had that happen before. Will you, will you tell me the truth? Well, you're the one I've been waiting on. I sure will. Um, verse 22, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip uh, tell Jesus. In verse 23, and Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And if you underline things in your Bible, I want to encourage you to underline that one. That way, as you're skipping through pages one day, that might jump out at you. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, I don't remember if I finished saying what I was saying a while ago, but as pertains to certain people in this world that have done such wicked abominations. I told this person, if I didn't believe in a God who had a trial for every person who's lived on this earth at the end of their life they're going to stand trial and having been found guilty by God himself because of the wickedness of their deeds and they are unrepented of uh, that person will spend eternity in a lake of fire if, and I said if I didn't believe that it would it would make me desire to carry out vengeance on certain people by myself. And that's not a good thing. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I sometimes, believe it or not, I, I have to remind myself of that. Mike, they're not going to get away with these things. They're, it's not going to happen. God is their judge and God is going to judge them. And there'll be no Valkyries deciding who gets killed quickly in battle and who doesn't. Because whether it takes them a long time in agonizing death to die or they die a sudden death, 
the lake of fire is for eter eternal, eternity, everlasting to everlasting. The lake of fire will last forever. And they would only wish that their death could have been prolonged, painful as it might be. So I want you to think about what he said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word tonight. Lord, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a mind and a heart uh, that would accept your word, that would believe it and understand, Father, that nobody, nobody gets out of this life without paying for their sins, except they call upon the name of the Lord for mercy and for grace the way your people have tonight. Father, I'm very glad that you're a graceful God, that you're a merciful God, that you're a God that when we call upon your name, you will have mercy upon us. And Lord, once that mercy is in place, it matters not how long any of us might have to suffer to achieve death. Once we have left this world, because of the promises that you've made to us, we get to be part of that kingdom that is coming, that everlasting kingdom that is full of joy, that is full of peace. There is no suffering. There is no sorrow. There is no more death. There is no more sin. There is nothing else, Father, that can hurt us or hurt the people that we love and care about. Father, that's the kingdom that we long to be part of in this life and in the life to come. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would give us a good, healthy understanding of what death really is to those who are truly born again. And help us, dear God, to not fear it, but in maybe in some ways ask you, Father, to hasten that day because, Father, it's that event that brings us into that next life, that everlasting life, that life that is full of joy, that is so beyond our comprehension, Lord. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Lord, bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus, uh, we're going to go back a little bit. And read this again, but I want you to notice that Jesus is using the illustration of, of a seed. He has done that several times before in the book of Matthew, and especially Matthew 13. If you just want to go back and look at that, we're not going to read that chapter. We're not going to read out of it. I may point to a few things here and there in Matthew 13, but Matthew 13 is a chapter. Let's see how many verses in that, 58 verses that one after another after another is chock full of stories that deal with seed and planting a seed in the ground. You have the, if, uh, you have the story, the parable of the, if any man will have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and it shall be done. I've spent all last week in the mountains and I'm looking at these mountains and I'm going, my goodness, what, what power put them there? What power pushed them up? And how much power would it take to lift one of these mountains up into the air and cast into the Pacific, the Atlantic, or the Gulf of Mexico, or whatever? And yet Jesus said it just takes faith as a grain of a mustard seed to do that. That's where he tells us the parable of the seed and the sower. Where the sower goes out to sow seed. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell among stony ground. Some among thorny ground. Some... Uh, fell among good ground and produced fruit. Uh, he tells the story there of the wheat and the tares. How the, the husbandman went out and sowed wheat or had his servant sow wheat out in the field while they slept at night. Sure enough, his enemy came in with a bag full of tares, poison darnell, fake wheat, look-alike wheat, counterfeit wheat. 
and sowed that then amongst the seed that he had and nobody knew it. Then it started springing up and the husbandman's looking out. Boy, look at that beautiful green field we've got. Boy, it looks like the harvest is going to be good. Then at some point, one of his men come running in and say, uh, uh, My Lord, uh, some of that's not wheat. We found quite a bit of it that's tares. And we can't have that. Tares are poisonous. We don't, we don't want that. We don't want that mixed in what we're doing. Shall we go gather it now? No, don't gather it now. Because you may not be able to tell the difference right now because it all looks green. Let's wait till harvest. And harvest, again, keep this in your mind. Anytime you see a harvest of something, it's all about transformation. Okay? How do you know the apples are ripe? The red apples, they turn from green to red. How do you know the tomatoes are ripe? Green to red. How do you know the peaches are ripe? I went out, oh my goodness. Peach picking. Go out to Eckert's. Next time, I think it's over. I think peach season is over now. Go out to Eckert's and get on that wagon and go out there. And I challenge you to pick and eat as many peaches as you possibly can. Because I did it. And when I got done, I had handfuls of peaches that I thought, well, I'm going to keep these. And no sooner than I got on that wagon for them to take us back, I'm going. <laughs> Sick as a dog. And the lady laughed at me. And she said, we had a guy out here last week that ate so many peaches. We literally had, all, about, about four or five of us, had to pick him up and lay him up in that wagon because he couldn't move. He was so sick. And they slowly drugged that wagon back to the parking lot where they literally picked him up off that wagon and sat him down until the sickness kind of made its way through. He had eaten so many of those pears. But you go out there, and I figured it out quickly. All you got to do is just, just take a little squeeze at them. And when they give in just a little, oh, that's ripe. Eat it right then. Just take it and go. <laughs> And I had juice. I mean, I had everything. But anyway, I got to move on. That's all about seed. It's all about seed. How can you get good peaches like that if you're holding on to the seed like you don't want to give it up? And then that night, laying in that hotel room, we had accompanied my dad's body down to the family cemetery down in uh, Enola, Arkansas. And Marcus Hill Baptist Church, Marcus Hill Cemetery. And though I couldn't preach my dad's funeral, it was, I said, I'll do the gravesite ceremony. But I'm sitting in the hotel room going, God, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I can do this. And the Holy Ghost just loves to whisper scripture to you. Mike, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And the Holy Ghost said, Mike, you're not burying your dad. You're planting the seed. Mm, mm, mm. Had, a little, had a little glory time that night. And the next day, with family, we had family come in, some of the old hoggard bunch that were still alive, they came in. And that's what I told them all. I said, I'm not burying my dad today. They went, what? I said, I'm planting a seed in hope that one of these days, Something new is going to come up out of the ground that I've never seen before. And that's what I'm hoping on. That's where my hope is right now. 
Amen. So, I want you to think about death. I want you to think about your own death. Or think about the death of those who have gone on before. As I had mentioned to you, my aunt uh, down in Georgia, the Atlanta area, uh, my uncle Juan passed away. Uh, he was a God-fearing man. Him and my uh, uh, aunt Mary Jo, they've been church people for as long as I can remember and uh, loved the Lord, good Baptist people. And when I found out that, that my uncle was watching the Watchman video broadcast, I went, what? And we put him on our mailing list and uh, he enjoyed my videos, I guess, until the day that he passed away. That was always a source of blessing to me. But that seed, that shell of a body that he had lived in all his life was just that. It was the shell of something that was inside of him that was much greater than what we could see on the outside. And, the, and though we weep and we mourn, it's natural, we weep and we mourn over those loved ones that we have lost, that have succumbed to death. Why should we not at some point glory in the Lord that we have, or God has now released them from this horrible thing called the flesh. And now they're free and they're never going to be in bondage again. That's how you see it. That's how you're supposed to look at it. Somebody, somebody dies of a long-term disease. Once they draw in that last breath and once they close their eyes for the last time, yes, it's normal to mourn that. It's normal to weep over that. We're never going to see them again in this world and we're going to miss them but rejoice because they've been cut free and cut loose and now they're enjoying the blessings of the Lord somebody say amen except a, except and, and Jesus speaks this of his own death he says in verse 23 the hours come that the son of man should be glorified how is he going to be glorified because after the cross, when everybody thinks he's good and dead, they're going to see him again. In just a matter of three days, they're going to see him again. And the saints, the disciples, and Mary, and the Mary, and Mary, and all the other Marys that was in the New Testament, they shout, Amen. The 12 disciples, their glory, 11 of them. One of them's going, Amen. But they're shouting, they're rejoicing that he's alive. Pilate's going, uh oh. Herod's going, uh oh. And they try, if you remember, they tried to make up some story. They killed the guards, or we're going to kill the guards. They questioned them and said, How come you let this happen? Like the guards could have held him back. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 12. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation. Now, don't let, don't let what I'm saying um, cause you to misunderstand what I believe about salvation. You are in the category right now of those who are saved. Your name is written in the book of life. Uh, it's a done deal. But has your salvation fully come yet? No, because you still carry this. Okay. Um, somebody I want you to pray for. I... I don't have permission to say who it is, so I'm not going to say who it is, but somebody in our church, uh, Monday and Tuesday, were in the presence of someone who has COVID. 
So now they have that to worry about. Um, nobody here is in any danger because of it. it. It happened after Sunday, so it's no big deal for as far as going through the church again. But here they are dealing with COVID again. And what could happen? We've already seen the effects of COVID. COVID can kill people. But when they die, they're never, ever, ever going to have to be afraid of COVID ever again. Ever. Because it doesn't affect the new body. And I heard a voice, loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation. So, yes, you are saved, but the fullness of your salvation has not been manifested yet because you still carry the body that can catch COVID, it can catch the flu, it can get cancer, it can get any number of diseases and maladies and who knows what, it'll succumb to old age one of these days. I mean, who knows how you're going to die. But as far as that is concerned, you still have not, how is it that John said it? Now we are sons of God, but it does not appear what we are. I think Paul said it. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We have been given the title of sons of God, but it has not been manifested what we are will appear like when we become the sons of God, if that makes sense. Now has come salvation and strength and, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by, number one, the blood of the Lamb. I'm here to tell you, if you do not have the blood of the Lamb Applied in your life, you cannot overcome the wicked one. You cannot overcome temptation. You cannot overcome the urge to sin. You cannot overcome that on your own. I don't care how many, I don't care how many seminars you go to. I don't how many mental wellness books that you read. I don't care if you're part of the uh, power of positive thinking movement. None of that works. It is the blood of the Lamb that overcomes sin and temptation. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. We had a man in this church that for years, whatever pastor we had, he was that pastor's right-hand man. He just, that's just, that was his ministry. That was his, he was a former Lutheran. And um, we had a daycare. This is back in the old days. We had a daycare at the time. And the daycare, he had, a, he had a couple of daughters. And he would bring them, drop them off at the daycare on his way to work. He worked for AT&T. And... Um, the preacher at that time, preacher golf, began to talk to him, work with him, and finally led him to the Lord. And his life was altogether different. And I can remember he was the pastor's right-hand man, the pastor that was here before I became pastor. And when I could see that at some point I might get to be the pastor of this church, I'd always look forward to the day where this man could be my right-hand man. But he died. Um, he had not been doing well for a while, didn't know what was wrong. He went to the doctor. They did some tests. They told him he had cancer. And a month later, we held his funeral. His brother Warren Bergman. And, but I remember talking to him, going by his house when he was, man, he was sick. And him saying to me, Mike, don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Even if you see me close my eyes, 
I'm not dead. And will never be dead. Ever. Believe it or not, um, because I knew the funeral director who was going to go and pick up his body, I had helped him before several, on several occasions, and I told him, I said, when you get ready to go over there, call me and I'll help you. And I helped pick up that man's dead body, put it in a body bag, put it on the stretcher, load it up in the back of the car, and I remembered what he had told me. Even if you see my eyes closed, I'm not dead. And there's not a chance that I'm ever going to be dead. I'm alive. You just can't see it. But I'm alive. That man knew it. It wasn't just a wish that he had. It was his hope. That he was going to live. The moment he stopped breathing. His real life began right then. And that's what that's saying. They love not their lives unto the death. Now, it doesn't take much for us to realize that most of the people, Cubby, that lives in this country right now, loves themselves so much that they don't care about anybody else, including their own children. The foster care system in this country is overrun now with children whose birth parents will not take care of them. And you know why? They love themselves more than they love even their own children. And that's the opposite of how real parents are supposed to be, is it not? They will willingly sacrifice their own children for the sake of their own gratification, for the sake of their own betterment, for the sake of their own lives, their own pride, or whatever it is. Those people have got a hard day of judgment coming to them. But if you will look at your life in this world the way the Bible teaches you to look at your life in this world, you will ask yourself the question, is there anything in this world that I want to hang on to so bad I'm willing to miss heaven over it? Not a thing. Not a thing. They love not their lives unto the death. And let me tell you, people like that, you can't hurt them. You can't hurt them. You, you can't threaten them. What are you going to do? Take away my birthday? Bring it on. What are you going to do? Kill me? Ooh, that's going to be bad if you kill me. Bring it on. Oh, no. We're going to make you suffer. My Lord suffered. And I communed with him one day. And I said, Lord, if you suffered and you caused me to suffer, I'll suffer too. This do in remembrance of me is what this table is all about. Amen? And that's how we're supposed to see it. That's how we're supposed to view our own death. Is to, and let me say this. Over the years, I've gotten a lot of emails from a lot of scared people who have been reading the internet Bible. The YouTube Bible. Turn to the, turn to the book of first YouTube, video 27. 
They have been watching YouTube videos. They've been watching um, conspiracy videos, reading conspiracy blogs. And you know what? I heard, I'm not kidding you. I heard this from somebody because they didn't like my response to something. Pastor Mike, don't you see? They're out to kill all of us Christians. Yeah. Well, I hope they succeed. Because when they do, it will. It fulfilled prophecy. Listen to this guy. Derek said that. They fulfill prophecy. And when they do, we're coming back. Revelation 19, we're the 10,000s of the saints that return with Christ. And they're going to look at us and go, uh-oh. <laughs> Whose idea was it to kill all the Christians? <laughs> I love you. Listen, I love you people online. Stop being made to see. Let me tell you what that stuff's all about. That stuff is intended to scare you to death. That, that stuff is intended to scare you into hiding who you are. I've had calls from people and I would, we'd be talking about something and they would say something like, well, pastor, that, there's some things I want to tell you, but I, I, I won't tell you over the phone. Why not? Well, what, do what? They're listening. And I would say, yeah, so? Well, I don't want them to hear what I, because then they'll target me. Number one, really? <laughs> but number two, I always say, you know what? I am never going to be afraid of who's listening to anything I say, because I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to give them the word of God. I'm going to tell it like it is. And number one, that just might change somebody. But number two, if it doesn't, and I'm, and I'm going to go down for it, I'd rather go down for saying scripture than for any other reason in the world. So, you know what? I'm not hiding who I am from anybody or any artificial intelligence in this world. I am not hiding anything from anybody about what I believe and who I am. Amen? Amen? Stop being afraid that they're going to kill you. Because they're going to kill you. Jesus, he said those exact words. Some of them, they will kill you. Now, I don't know who that is. Some people will have to endure hardship. Some people will be persecuted. Some people will be killed. But you know what? That's our heritage going all the way back to the days of Stephen. And on the day that Stephen, listen to this now, on the day that they killed Stephen, you know what he was doing? He was trying to keep the Jews from hearing what he had to say about Jesus. No, he wasn't. He was telling them everything he could about Jesus using the stories of Moses and all the other stories in the Old Testament. And it got them so mad that they ripped their clothes and they said, Aah! and they stood him out there and they brought stones and they started pelting him with stones. And Stephen, before he died, got to see Jesus standing at the right hand of the father. And he said so in front of everybody. And the Bible just said that he lay down and fell asleep. That's how I want to go. Amen. Psalm 126, 5. They that sow in tears, I already talked about that. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You can see this all through the Bible, the death and resurrection of hope, through the flood. How is it that all the plants grew back after the flood? There was, the seeds were all over the ground. And, they, and Noah didn't have to do anything. Boing! Here they come. 
Joseph, dead to his father at 17, revealed as alive, age 39. Moses and the children of Israel. The Shunammite woman's son died and was raised again. David's firstborn son from Bathsheba, he died. But his secondborn son from Bathsheba was Solomon. The greatest king that ever lived aside from Jesus Christ. So tell me how somebody or something dying is the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. Because I will tell you that a greater blessing comes from it. Now I'm just going to give you this and then we'll go to prayer. I've seen it a million times in my life. That's an exaggeration, maybe. How God had to kill something in my life or related to my life so that he could make room for his double blessing in my life. What was it that the scripture says? He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Roy, for the all I've known you and Bonnie, from the moment you came here, that I remember the Sunday you were here, first Sunday you were here, and you asked me a question out there in the foyer, and you said, won't you come by the house Saturday and we'll talk about it. And I was out at your house that Saturday. From that day, I knew that Bonnie had dealt with cancer. She had dealt with it before that day. You guys started coming here. She dealt with it several times after you started coming here. And it finally took her life. The good news is, it'll never happen again. Ever. That in itself is enough to rejoice in the Lord over is that she will never be plagued by this ever again. Amen? Amen. Um, I'm doing, what I'm, what I'm about to do is by permission. And I'm going to mention a name, and this person, and, and I forgot to tell Rose, so it's my fault. But this person asked that her name be placed like second or third on the prayer list under Brother Mike and Lisa and Sterling and Gloria. And her name is Isabella. So on your prayer list, right there after Sterling and Gloria, I want you to write the name Isabella. Some of you, you know who she is, okay? I can't tell you why, but she has asked me to put her name near the top of the prayer list, okay? Until I get permission to say why, I can't say why. Uh, if she gives me permission, then I will tell only this church. But it's uh, Dee's granddaughter, and she has asked us, her church, her safe place, to pray for her. Because she is fighting a very, very serious battle. Okay? And it could be a dangerous one. That's all I can say right now. So I want you to pray for her. And lift her up. Of course, pray for Brother Sterling, Sister Gloria. Um, even though he had the shot to the cement to fuse that together in his bone, uh, he's still in a lot of pain. So please pray for Brother Sterling. Pray, of course, for Lisa and I and our work here, the work that all these girls do here. Pray for Brother John, the work that he does. Pray for Brother Michael. Uh, the work that he is doing right now, uh, of which I can't tell you about. Okay? 
One of these days I will, uh, as he gives me permission, but just pray for him. Yes, Alicia. Pray for his son, yes. Because of the amount of hours and stress that he has on him right now, his health is not good. And um, he's had to uh, go to the doctor, go to the hospital, have some blood work done. They've checked out some things in him, put him on some medication, very strong, powerful medication. Uh, but I want you to pray for Michael, okay, and lift him up. Um, just very quickly, let me look here. Sister Pam's uh, mother-in-law passed away. Sister Pam is back. We're glad that she made it back safely and glad to have her back here. So pray for her. Uh, let's see here. I, I have um, a, I announced it today. I've been talking about this German film crew. They're going to be here August 6th during our homecoming. Okay? The best possible crowd we could ever have in this church is homecoming. Did you hear that, people? It's on you. If you don't show up, I'm going to be ticked. And I won't broadcast for a month. Okay? Um... Uh, but again, they are willing to promote a, a certain ministry that this church has. Um, I don't know how far, I, w I don't know where they're going to distribute the, the documentary they're working on. I don't know. I, I know doing a documentary takes a long time. Even after they've got it filmed, there's editing and all that stuff. And then there has to be dis a distributor chosen to distrib distribute the thing and all kinds of things could happen. So it's going to be a while. But uh, let's just pray that God would bring the increase from that. And I, th You know what? I've not said one thing to them about money. I've not asked them how much they're going to pay us. I'm not, I haven't said one thing about it. The only thing I'm interested in is that they will let me, and I believe they will, they will let me give the word of God out. And God's going to bless his word wherever it goes. Okay? And uh, so just pray uh, that, God, that God will use that. All right? 